The Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to baptize by him. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so, no, for thus it is filling for to be fulfilled all righteousness. Then the consented, and when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Good job, Eddie. All right, all right. Fabulous. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, this passage has got some issues, and I want to talk about them with you. Um, I have a couple of issues here, and I hope you're ready to have a conversation. This conversation might be one way, I don't know. Anyway, the first issue is related to the second issue, and the first issue comes from last week. Uh, some of you that were not here last week, um, it was the eighth day of Christmas, the New Year's passage, which everyone knows in the lectionary, who's been around in church for a re really long time. It's only one sentence. <laughs> It's the circumcision of Jesus. It's a one-sentence gospel reading. It's kind of funny uh, the way that works out in the lectionary. But the circumcision of Jesus. I have a lot of questions. First of all, uh, the whole point of circumcision is that the Jews believe that the promise that was made to Abraham of the coming Messiah would come through Abraham's seed. Through his seed would come the Redeemer. According to the Christmas story, as you heard a couple of weeks ago, um, the seed was not passed through Joseph. So that's the, word, the first weird issue. But that's not all. If Jesus is the one, if he is truly the Messiah, why is he getting circumcised? There's no next generation. He's not going to have kids. Haven't you thought about this? Has this ever passed through your mind? You're like, no, pastor, we don't question that kind of stuff. But it is weird, don't you think? This doesn't make sense at all. I don't know. You Christians have a lot of explaining to do. Don't you? Oh, but that's not the only thing. That's not the only big issue. What about this week? Why is Jesus getting baptized? John was right. He was like, what the? Why am I baptizing you? You should be baptizing me. You should be baptizing us. Jesus has no need for redemption himself. He's supposed to be the redeemer. The whole important point of Jesus' sinless perfection is that he doesn't need redemption himself. His love, his forgiveness, hear me out, does not come from a place of debt to sin. His grace is unconditional. That's the whole point of that. My grace toward others comes from a place of debt, right? Someone does something terrible, what do I say? Oh, everybody does that. We're all in the same boat. I do it too. I've probably done worse than that over my life. Right? Don't we say that? We're all in a place of debt. We exchange it like, hey, you, I'll forgive you if you forgive me. You know what I mean? This happens in our spouse relationship all the time. But Jesus doesn't have that relationship to the world. Jesus is the perfect unblemished sacrifice. So he can credibly and truthfully give grace unconditionally without needing it himself. 
So why is he getting baptized? Now you're with me, aren't you? What is the point of this? My baptism and your baptism helps us in times of trouble, right? To not lose our faith when we really have doubts and we're like, oh my goodness, am I, have I fallen away? We say, wait a minute, I've been baptized. Wait a minute, I've been baptized. Sinner and all, into Christ I've been baptized. Some say, haven't I passed the point of no return? Haven't I gone too far? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I've been baptized. Our culture has this problem a lot. More than you would think. We learn that our, our baptism is an anchor against this stuff that we get from our culture. It's an assurance of God's love. We realize we belong to Christ. You hear that in the baptism ceremony. We are forever united to his life, death, and resurrection. We are a permanent member of the body of Christ, which is the Christian church. But Jesus, he's the foundation and the cornerstone of the Christian church. Why does he need a public inclusion into a church that he owns responsibility for and has purchased at a price with his death on the cross? Answer, answer, answer. You might say, oh, well, pastor, it's early in the gospels. He hasn't died on the cross yet. That's even more reason for him not to be baptized. So why? Why was he baptized? John was right. Jesus appears to not need baptism. So why did he get baptized and why did he get circumcised? You're looking at me like I'm crazy, right? We know you're crazy way before this. Answer, it's important for Jesus to be a part of God's chosen people. It's important that Jesus comes out of the Hebrew community. It's essential that Jesus is a Jew, raised in the Hebrew tradition. And the most important part of that was his circumcision. It was the mark of being a Jew. It's at that moment, at his circumcision, that his name, Jesus, is proclaimed to the public for the first time. This is when the name which is above all names was made known to the world. The name Jesus that was given to Joseph by God's messenger from above was proclaimed to God's chosen people. Oh, you know what's coming next, right? The same thing. His office as the Son of God. The word spoken from heaven that you heard in this morning's scripture. This is my beloved Son, by whom I am well pleased. This was God's heavenly endorsement for the church to hear and to witness about Jesus. Now this is where the sermon gets a little weird. You're like, the sermon's already weird. No, this is where it gets really weird. And, I, and I'm, I'm using this as an example because I'm, I'm trying to make a theological point. So it is going to sound bizarre. The voice that came down from heaven that you heard in this morning's scripture, was it loud? Was it quiet? Did it come out of speakers? Did it have sound waves? Where did it come from? Do you know? What do you think when you hear the scripture read or when you read the scripture, what do you think was happening? Did the, the sound waves go into the people's ears and they heard something? 
It sounds like a silly thing to ask, but think about that. What do you mean a loud voice or a, a voice from heaven? Am I lost in the details? You're like scared. Uh-oh. I better get to the point. I have a thought for you. If a person, a non-believer, got in a time machine, went back 2,000 years to the moment that Jesus was baptized, got out of the time machine, walked out to the river, all the people were gathering, there's two men in the river there, John the Baptist and Jesus, all of a sudden, Jesus comes out of the water. And there's a pause, and the crowd goes, <gasps> and the non-believer's like, what, what happened? Didn't you hear that? And they say, I didn't hear nothing. What are you talking about? Some dude got a quick bath. What are we talking about here? I didn't hear anything. Think about that for a minute. Think about what happened in that very moment. What was going on? And who received what? How did they receive it? It's amazing. Jesus is included as the Son of Man, the ideal Jew, in and among his people, which are God's chosen people to bring God's promised Messiah into the world. But in the same way, Jesus is baptized. He is included in the developing Christian church as not only the Son of Man, a product of generations of God's people, but also the Son of God sent from above. God says, this is whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This marks the beginning of his ministry. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. People saw him as the Messiah for the first time, and God endorsed it to the church who was able to hear. At that very moment, what happened? He was sent out into the wilderness to be tempted for real. Not in theory, not kind of, you know, he was there 40 days to be tempted in the wilderness. But before he goes, he's baptized. Christ's obedience, his participation in the life of the Hebrew people, and his practice in the emerging Christian church is not an abstraction. Some theoretical concept of perfection it was a real life, practiced, lived and breathed obedience to God's law. It was a faith that was practiced over and over and over again. As I was sitting, um, with a parishioner last week, we were having lunch, it was fun, and we kind of talked about, you know, the last couple of years and how churches kind of, tenants has ebbed and flowed and all this kind of stuff. And we talked about like weekly attendance versus once a year attendance. We're coming off of Christmas and we had said, oh, we saw so-and-so, we haven't seen him in a year, you know. And we were just talking about, you know, sparsely attended church and everything. And we asked ourselves, why do we go to church every week? Like, why not just once a month or once in a while? Why every week? And we, I, I, first of all, I said, I work here, you know. But uh, the conversation kind of progressed, and we were thinking, um, we practice our faith. It's a repetition that's important to do. It's important because the service that we have is like ingrained in us. It's a part of our being. 
Um, I have friends that come from out of town uh, that grew up with me in California and we, in our non-denominational church days. And, you know, they, they're very thrown off by the fact that every time they come here, we say the same thing. You guys say the same thing every service, you know, same prayers, same words. What's going on? You know, be spontaneous, right? And the thing is, is that service, I know that service when I leave this building and go out into the world, I can repeat that entire service, not because I'm a pastor, but you can too. I start any one of the things that we say at service and my girls will rattle them off, right? Or if, I, if I'm at lunch with you all and we start saying the Apostles' Creed, you guys start saying it with me, right? The word of God has been placed upon our heart. It's ingrained in us. It's part of our being. We hear the word of God and we respond. God has actually written his word in our hearts. And to the non-believer, it's just gibberish. It means nothing. They don't hear it even if they could hear it. But to the faithful, these words are the cornerstone and the foundation of our faith. Amen?